Jensen Huang, the CEO of NVIDIA, says the future is agentic. During an interview with Mark Benioff, the CEO of Salesforce, at the Dreamforce conference, he talks about how we are going to have thousands and even millions of agents working for us every day, all day. It is an agentic future, and we're going to break down the video right now. Jensen, come on out. Our industry is, you know, call it about a trillion dollars, and it's an industry of tools. You know, computers, um, software, they're an industry of tools. For the very first time, this is going to be an in industry of skills. And you capture that, that phrase, and you, uh, you call it agents. But it's going to be, for the very first time, agents sitting on top of tools. Agents using tools. And the, the opportunity for agents is gigantic. As we know, you know, we, we now know, we now know. I'm hoping so, by the way. Uh <laughs> so obviously I agree. If you've watched this channel at all, you know, the phrase I always say, bullish on agents. I really believe the best incarnation of AI in the future is going to be agents and agentic frameworks. And Mark Benioff, the reason why he's saying I really hope so is because of Agent Force, which is, again, their new product that they're launching. They really think this is going to be transformational to Salesforce, which has been around forever, at least forever in internet terms. And they are betting big on it. And he actually gives a little dig towards Microsoft, which we'll hear in a moment. It sounds, it sounds insane, but here's the amazing thing. We're going to have agents that obviously uh, understand, understand the subtleties of the things that we ask it to do, but... Uh, it can also uh, use tools and it can reason and uh, it can reason with each other and collaborate with each other and you know gonna, we're going to give we're going to give a problem to uh, agent force mm -hmm. and uh, uh, agents are going to go find other agents uh, that that can help achieve this mission. Uh, they'll work together, assemble together, work together and solve this problem. And so that is absolutely the agentic future that I envision. There are agents, agents can spawn other agents, they can collaborate with other agents. There's a set of tools, and I'm not talking about three, four, five tools, thousands, hundreds of thousands of tools that these agents can pick and choose and also create tools themselves and actually test the tools, save the tools, use them later. These are all things that we're just starting to scratch the surface on right now. And as the core models get better, the large language models get better, as the agentic frameworks around those large language models get better, as the ability for those agents to build their own tools, to choose tools off the shelf, get better, all of these agents become exponentially more powerful. And remember, the definition of an agent is a large language model with the ability to use tools, to collaborate with other agents, and that has memory, short-term and long-term memory. That's my favorite definition of an agent. All right, let's keep watching. I think the, the, the breakthrough uh, for, for me was, was at a moment when, when um, uh, we realized that unsupervised learning was going to be possible. Because the ability for humans to, to uh, be able to la label data at scale, uh, that we would become the limit limiters of these digital digital AI to, to uh, uh, expand their capabilities. And uh, when, when unsupervised learning came along, which allowed us to use language models, to create language models which codify human prior knowledge, using that to now learn multimodality, multimodal uh, uh, data, uh, then from that point forward, it would, the, the scale was going to be exponential. All right. So he just said a lot in very few words. So let me break that down for you. First, he's talking about the fact that humans are really the limiting factor for artificial intelligence. The amount of data we create is massive, obviously, but the amount of data that is ingested by artificial intelligence is much more. And for the most part, all public data has been used already. It's all been used by these frontier models and even open source and non-frontier models. All of the open data is gone. It's been used. So now, there's proprietary data, data behind paywalls or auth walls, stuff like Reddit and Twitter and Facebook, all of this data that 
these companies will use themselves to make their models distinct and better than their competition. So then he's talking about reinforcement learning without the need for humans, because another limiting factor of humans is the ability to label data. If we have to label all the data that trains the AI, that is an extreme bandwidth limitation. And so we have projects like AlphaGo, where AlphaGo, the AI behind it, was not trained by humans. It was not trained with a bunch of Go games where humans labeled them good move, bad move. They simply spawned a bunch of different versions of the AI, played the game, see which one did best, and then iterated on that millions or billions of times. And then eventually they surpassed the best human Go players in the entire world. And again, that's with basically no human input whatsoever. Then we have the notion of how are we going to scale the data? So I already talked about all of the public data being used. There's really two paths. One, we can either do a lot more with the data we have, and that's things like being able to scale test time compute, which means during inference time, we do things like chain of thought. And now we have this entire new dimension of scalability on AI, which is super fascinating. So previously we were just scaling the number of parameters and that really scaled pretty well so far, but now we have two distinct dimensions that we can scale on. The number of parameters and kind of the training time compute and then the post training test time compute when it's actually running through chain of thought. And then the other part is synthetic data. So what if we use AI to create really great data for other AI? And OpenAI has been rumored to be doing that through the QSTAR project, which eventually became O1. Maybe O1 is creating data for other models. All of this is fascinating, but the more we can remove humans from being a limiting factor in AI, the more quickly AI is going to explode into the intelligence explosion. You know, for, for everybody here, uh, th this, is, this is an extraordinary time because uh, in no time in history has computer technology not only uh, uh, moved faster than Moore's Law. I mean, we're, uh, Moore's Law, for example, uh, over, the course of, uh, over the course of a decade would be about 100x. Um, we are probably advancing at somewhere near 100 That was our other neighbor in Hawaii, Gordon Moore. Oh, is that right? Great person, yeah, great, great leader. Great person. And, and so we're, we're, we're at a stage now. So quickly, Moore's Law basically says that every 18 months, the number of transistors that can be fit onto a CPU essentially doubles. So your ability to compute essentially doubles every 18 months. But a while ago, we reached a physical limitation and we really cannot shrink these transistors anymore. And they just don't work after that. And so we really did hit this limitation and then AI came around and GPUs came around and all of a sudden, rather than serialized compute, which is how CPUs work, we have parallel compute and that's how GPU works. It does a bunch of calculations simultaneously and because of the way AI works plus parallel compute, all of a sudden Moore's law has actually been exceeded lately and every six months we are doubling the compute power of chips. Now we're in an era now where, where we're moving way faster than Moore's law. And, and um, uh, arguably, easily, Moore's Law squared. And, and the, reason, the reason for that, of course, is at every single layer, computers went from CPUs to GPUs, uh, from human-engineered software to machine learning software. And, and now this feedback loop um, that allows us to, to um, uh, create new AIs uh, and these new AIs are helping us create new computer systems. So he said something really interesting, but he said it so quickly, it almost went unnoticeable. He said that AI is creating more and more of our software. And I've talked a lot about that on this channel. Again, removing the human limitation from the system that we're trying to scale up will allow us to scale up the system much more quickly. Just two years ago, humans were writing all software. So we were really limited in the amount of software we can write because it's a very manual and difficult thing for humans to to do. But as large language models got better at writing code, they started writing more and more code. And then we have all of these projects like Cursor and Replit building infrastructure around large language models to make it even easier for AI to write code. And I believe in the short run and the mid run, we are going to have an explosion in the number of people who write code because it won't take writing actual code all you have to do is speak or type natural language and then the AI will write the code for you. Then at a certain point, 
AI will just write code as needed. And then the end vision is really just model weights being shipped by the AI itself. So rather than it writing code, it's just writing model weights. And at that point, we're probably not gonna be able to read the code at all. I've been thinking about this idea that in the future, we probably won't be able to read the code that AI writes because the only reason code looks the way it does today is because humans are really bad at reading and writing code. So it has to look as much like natural language as possible, but maybe in the future, it doesn't have to, and probably in the future, it doesn't have to, especially if the compute platform of the future is simply model weights, because we already cannot read model weights. We don't know what's in the black box of AI, at least not yet. Maybe we will in the future, but it's not looking likely. The challenges that we have in front of us are, are many and worthy to be tackled right away. Um, of course, some of the, some of the most, most um, uh, inspiring advances has to do with fine-tuning, supervised um, uh, guard, and guard railing and, and, um, uh, and uh, um, all of the work that surrounds safety, um, everything from using AI to curate the data to create safe curriculum to teach the AI, which then fine-tunes the AI on particular skills that ground it on values, then, then all of this wonderful AI technology to guardrail it, um, and guardrailing, and then re reflection, uh, using, using chain of thought to reflect on the quality of the answers that it's producing. You know, it's no longer AI, this one shot producing information. It's now reasoning about, is, this, is the, 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 uh, the answer I'm generating uh, sufficiently safe and proper? And is it the best possible answer I could be? I, could be? I am so excited about this particular concept that we're able to now scale artificial intelligence on two different dimensions. And I've talked about it already in this video. So just briefly, I want to reemphasize how important it is that we now can scale compute and scale AI intelligence at the training time and the amount of data we feed that model. And then also at test time, which is even more scalable in my mind, because the more time you give it, the more compute you give it, the more tokens it can churn through to generate the best possible output. And that's what he's talking about with reflection and chain of thought. That's exactly what O1 from OpenAI that just dropped about a week ago, that is what it is doing and why it has really just jumped ahead of all the other models in terms of logic and reasoning. To be providing, it's reasoning with itself and it's, uh, it's reflecting on the answers before it answers. And so I, I think the, the progress that we're made, making in safety is phenomenal. Yeah. Isn't it so important that people can actually understand, yeah. uh, this is what I call, they need to get their hands in the soil. They need to understand the basic ideas to make this possible, and that's what I hope you know, happens with the thousands of people here, that they can get in the code while they're here yeah. to really understand so when they're going back to their offices, you know, that exactly what you're saying, that we've demystified the AI, that you know, they don't have to worry about how they're going to DIY their AI, that they can somehow put all the hard work that your team has done, yeah. right, into some very practical use because this leap of faith that you've had, this, this strategic motion of your company has enabled so much of this. Now, how do we put it in the hands of everybody to, like, just get to work and Building an agent should not be some computer science uh, fair project. It should be something that we can easily right. do because... So when he's saying it's some computer science fair project, he is specifically referencing a lot of companies that have shipped products that are so difficult to really use in production environments that actually drive a lot of value. He specifically called out Microsoft with Copilot. He said it's basically their new version of Clippy. And Clippy was a complete failure of a product, and now he is equating Clippy to Copilot. And that is a huge dig at Microsoft that I don't really agree with. This is much different, even though the first wave of Copilot might not have been that valuable. I think a lot of what they're doing with integrating Copilot into all of their office products and Outlook, and I think that's great. It's going to be a lot more like onboarding employees than writing software. All right, I just want to talk about that for a second. So he talked about onboarding employees. Just last week, I had a conversation with Crew AI CEO, Joe, and we talked about agents 
being onboarded as employees. And that is a critically important piece of implementing AI at your company. Specifically, we drew an analogy to human onboarding. So when you hire somebody, if you don't give them any context, any training, any onboarding materials, then they're gonna be starting from scratch. And the onboarding period or the ramp up period is going to be really lengthy. And the way to shorten that is with training, is with context, is with onboarding materials. And it's the same thing with AI agents. If they simply start from nothing, then they have to learn everything as they go. And every prompt you give them has to be incredibly detailed. But when you work with a human, and the more you work with them, the more history you build with a human employee or colleague, the better shorthand you create with them. You start having to say less and describe less about exactly what you want, and you can kind of just directionally say what you want, and the human, your colleague, will understand. And that's going to be the same thing with AI. I think a big part of AI agents in the future is going to be defining how to onboard them quickly, giving them all of the memory necessary, giving them access to documentation, telling them exactly how you want them to respond and what tasks you want them to do so that when they get started, they're ready to hit the ground running. The ambition of wanting to reinvent computing uh, to create what we now know is, is, is such a great endeavor. Um, so somewhere between the, the being uh, inspired by all the stimulus, um, the, the, the incredible challenge ahead of us, uh, you know, it's, it's kept us propelled, um, inspired, and fired up for a long, long time. And now here we are. We now have the instruments, the tools, uh, this capability called artificial intelligence that goes solve all of those other problems that we've, you know, been excited about ever since we were kids. And, and so uh, that's pretty exciting times. So here we are at the cusp of a complete paradigm shift in computing, the base level computing from computing pre-written software and hard-coded everything to just-in-time, dynamically created, predicted software. And maybe not even software, maybe just user interfaces and just delivering what you need in the moment, and it's all predicted. It is a completely new way to think about computing, and it requires new chips, GPUs, and it requires new software model weights. And I'm so excited to be here and talk about it with you all. It is such a cool time to be alive. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please consider giving a like and subscribe and I'll see you in the next one.